sharing and sourcing show is the center for global business partnerships with India. In a course of three days, over 500 exhibitors from the Indian manufacturing sector get a chance to meet one-on-one -on -one with thousands of delegates from the world over. As part of the three-day event, a CXO forum featuring an esteemed panel discussed the potential India holds in becoming the world's next manufacturing hub over the course of the next five years. What will it take to make India a manufacturing hub? Our endeavor today is to draw up a five-year roadmap. Ladies and gentlemen, meet our panel. I'll start from the right, Ashish Chauhan, Managing Director and CEO, Bombay Stock Exchange. Harshal Jaivanth, President of the Engineering Business at Raymond Limited. Dr. P. Nandagopal, Managing Director and CEO, India First Life Insurance Company. To my left, Koshal Sampath, President and CEO, India, Dun & Bradstreet. Aman Chadda, Managing Director, Indo Nico Bearings and immediate past chairman of the EEPC, and Junya Ueda, general manager and head of Kubota IPO India. Gentlemen, great to have you here on the panel. I'm going to ask you first to really say what is the five-year promise of the manufacturing sector, particularly the engineering sector within manufacturing. Mr. Chadda, would you like to take that on? What is the promise? What is the hope that you have? Well, uh, according to a study by McKinsey, uh, we feel the manufacturing sector in India could grow to US dollars 1 trillion by 2025. Uh, that translates to roughly 20 to 25 percent of GDP, uh, again giving us employment of roughly 90 million people. Uh, the reason for this growth is primarily the demand in the country, the domestic demand, followed by other uh, MNCs looking at uh, making India a low cost base. In fact, according to ENY, 55 percent of MNCs want to come to India because of the domestic demand and 45% look at it as a low cost base. When we compare uh, our manufacturing in terms of percentage of the GDP, 16% which has stagnated over the past 10 odd years, we compare to China which is roughly 40%, Thailand 35%, uh, we come to Malaysia 31%, even countries like Vietnam have 21%. So, and these countries have leveraged their infrastructure and resources to make themselves competitive. Okay, that is why and because you acknowledge that 16% share of GDP has been a phenomena that India has had to deal with for a few years now, that's why I'm skeptical of the McKinsey estimates and I ask you a simple question, what will it take to make those numbers real? I would think the biggest uh, setback that the engineering sector has today is technology and value addition. When we look at value addition in the manufacturing sector, it's $83 per capita of GDP in India. We compare that with China, it is $496. We compare that with Brazil, $749. And we come to Mexico, $1,001. So there is a vast parity in the value addition that we are doing. This is what we need to look at and address. And I want to come to you, uh, Mr. Jaivan. What will it take to realize the promise of Indian manufacturing? If you had to put two points on the table, what would you put? One of the major issues today going forward is uh, building capacities in this country. And uh, one of the ingredients is going to be uh, availability of skilled labor. Uh, and when I say skilled labor, it means uh, something beyond what constitutes just a low-cost country. Uh, because a developed country today has started at some point of time at a low-cost low country, but over a period of time, technology, skill has made sure that the value addition keeps on increasing. And end of the day, you uh, are able to meet uh, the, the needs of all the stakeholders involved, including unions, including labor, including uh, your, 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 your management staff. You know? So I think uh, skill development, the capacity uh, uh, enhancement to ensure global competitiveness over a period of time are, I think, two key issues. Mr. Nandakopal, human resources, that's one part of the puzzle. Skill development, that's another part of the puzzle. Throw in another piece. Well, uh, as a key factors of production which are important for a proper manufacturing process, so when you look at human capital as the most important thing which Harshal covered about it, 
But I also look at the financial capital. The financial capital, I mean, it should be available at the right kind of uh, uh, cost. And if it is not available as much as you want at the right kind of price, at the right time, more importantly, then that's a problem. Currently, what's happening is maybe I think the, the traditional banking industry is only looking at manufacturing with a, with a certain kind of given set of rules where, you know, you'll have to look at some sort of a uh, fixed assets to mortgage to get the kind of bank loans and they may not be available for startup organizations and because of that a lot of entrepreneurial talent may be getting slightly diverted to other lines of businesses. So it's important for us to have really a very good financial capital available and both from traditional and alternate routes. So that's I think is another fundamental factor. I'd like to draw you in here Mr. John. You know reflect on the fact that a number of small and medium enterprises say one of their enduring grouses is ease of access to capital, timely capital, capital with rational collateral demands, capital with rational tenures for repayment. You know, what is the way going forward? I have heard this raised again and again, particularly by small and medium enterprises that indeed form the backbone of the engineering sector and indeed Indian manufacturing. What's the way forward? I think listing on BSE's SME platform is the way forward. Uh, basically, what happens is when you go to the banks, of course, as she said, you end up getting uh, uh, huge collateral demands and so on and so forth. But if you are growing faster than what your internal uh, sort of accruals allow you to, you need to go out and raise capital from general public. In the last 20 years, we had actually stopped small and medium sector companies from coming to the market. Only in the last one and a half, two years, BSC has set up an SME platform Today, uh, we have listed around 45 companies. 15 more would be list listed uh, in next one month. This is somewhat to the fundamental question. What will it take to realize the, the, you know, the promise of Indian manufacturing? Because indeed, the promise is there. However, realization falls short. I think one of the key stakeholders in this entire process is the government. And I'll start with a simple example. Thailand in 1995 had auto exports of 0 0.5 billion dollars, half a billion dollars. Our auto exports at that time were just under a billion, 0 0.9 billion. Today, Thai auto exports are 28 billion dollars. It has not happened by accident. There's been policy. There's been delivery around public-private partnerships. There's been infrastructure creation, etc. And I want to go through a laundry list of four or five points, actually, which, which we'll talk about. First, non-tariff barriers that our engineering sector faces when we go overseas. Simple example, again, Chile. The cost of our goods, our auto sector's productions in Chile, there's a 6% disadvantage because we don't have an FTA. We have a preferred trade arrangement with them, whereas China has an, has an FTA. So you have this, I mean, we've got so many examples of that sort of situation. Land acquisition, whether it's for a large uh, company or for SMEs which want to set up ancillaries around that large company. Environmental issues, try and set up a chemical plant which is supporting engineering or anything else and look at the number of effluent treatment issues you have to deal with the local trade promotion board. Infrastructure, just overall infrastructure. We are at a 7% cost disadvantage as compared to our competitors because of infrastructure. And these are estimates that have been made by experts. Transaction cost. We have one of the highest cost of transactions, uh, trans, you know, cost to export in this country. Today, I think uh, various uh, industry bodies have estimated that in terms of engineering goods, 10% of the value of the exports is just transaction cost, the cost of transaction. How do you, how do you actually survive in that kind of environment. And I think that the government has a big, big role to play in enabling it. It's not just through policy pronouncements, but it's through follow-up on the ground in order to really make it happen for the entrepreneurs in this room. Mr. Weda, productivity improvements here in India, you know, that's something that's within the grasp of everyone in the audience. They don't have to wait for the right-minded government to come along. They don't have to wait for, uh, you know, overwhelming changes. You do business with small and medium enterprises here in India as well. You procure from them. What's the approach that you've taken to, you know, boost productivity with your 
local suppliers, local partners. Regarding uh, our uh, IP office, uh, we procure uh, many parts uh, from India already, and uh, our company will not expect uh, low value added pro uh, products. Uh, we expect much more value added uh, products like uh, components like this. Uh, we have already uh, many suppliers in India, and uh, initially uh, they supply some uh, small parts or some uh, one part, single parts. Uh, after that, uh, we suggest uh, some improvement uh, from uh, single parts to uh, components. Uh, to achieve some targets, uh, we support uh, some improvement for the production process. Uh, because uh, we have many Kaizen professionals. Uh, we send uh, many Kaizen professionals to small and medium-sized company, and we support a uh, new production process for much more value-added some component products. Do you want to uh, come in on this, Mr. Jayavan, Mr. Chadda, just to reflect on what, it's, what is the industry doing on the productivity improvement side? When you look at the scenario of the manufacturing sector, how are they composed? We have 53 lakh <coughs> manufacturing units. 99% of them are very small in nature, employing 10 people and below. How do you expect them to improve productivity, put in uh, management skills, set skills? It's difficult. They simply can't afford it. So we have to probably think out of the box of how to improve management skills. Basic fundamentals, like if you look at preventive maintenance. Now we all know maintenance is there, preventive maintenance is there. And many a time we don't get into preventive maintenance because we feel the bush is okay, the bearings are okay, the oil is okay, let it go on, chalta hai. That should not be there. These basic housekeeping should be improved. If we probably do our maintenance on time, the machines would work. And what happens invariably in these small units that when we require them most, they shut down. Cooperation as we say. Think out, we know competition is fierce, products are coming into the country. H how, do, how do we survive if we don't cooperate amongst ourselves? Mr. Sampat? I just wanted to add, you know, there's another part where cooperation is really working and there's some live examples. Faridabad, for example. The Faridabad Small Industries Association is, has been running a program for procurement of uh, consumables. And they all pool their requirements and then when they go out and procure those consumables, the cost efficiencies that they are generating are tremendous. So you may not get scale if you are an individual unit, but if you pool together, you are actually able to do it. And it's a live example. It's working and you know everyone's getting the benefit. Was there um, a thought that you had on what the industry can do on productivity improvements? Well, I was just listening uh, with some kind of attention to what Kaushal is saying. That while uh, we uh, at the industry will always have some kind of a drawback as the government, and we always say that you know the government should do more for the country and more for the industry and all. But I think the charity begins at home, and uh, I believe that you know some of the best run uh, enterprises in this country, the business groups, where you call it Tata, Birla, Reliance, they all have started when the government support was not there or minimal. So I believe that for any business to make big and to make it uh, successful, it, your first we need to understand it is a tough job and we need to have the kind of entrepreneurial drive and if you have the kind of problem solving attitude, it can be through the cooperative effort of you know for us like this and for example if you look at the Amul success story and that's not happened because of the government support or subsidies or infrastructure uh, improvement and all that happened because you know there is an entrepreneurial drive and that you uh, and catch them. Sri so, Ramant, I, you know, I wanted to throw a slightly um, controversial question your way. I am an outsider to both manufacturing and services, and I look at what's happening in the IT industry. They had a skills shortage, and what did they do? They rolled up their sleeves, they went out there, and they built these large training programs, pretty colossal training programs. Um, I've not seen anything on that scale with that kind of impact when it comes to the manufacturing sector. Is it even viable? to suggest that kind of approach? Yeah, <clears throat> it's an interesting question and I think it's a very good observation. But end of the day, I think uh, businesses or uh, businesses which have been pushed into a corner, where they are faced with a lack of skill, for the sake of their businesses, they have been driven to find out solutions. I think the IT industry went through that. Uh, let's say 20 years back, there weren't um, engineering colleges churning out those many IT professionals, so to say. So they were churning out engineers and uh, it was for the IT industry to take charge of the situation to, to do that particular um, exercise on skill development. In our case, we face a similar issue and we've done it because we got pushed into a corner in an area where 
uh, availability of trained manpower was uh, was scarce and we got pushed into formulating schemes of training where we trained people from who are um, uh, who we picked up from schools from a 10th standard or 11th standard thing and trained them into operators now whether it can become a institutionalized process across the country uh, yes it can sorry i'd just like to comment on that so one of the things that really i think and some people have taken the lead i think maruti suzuki has adopted six itis now you've got this 2% csr spend which is becoming mandatory for all of us you know is there a way that you could actually collectively adopt some of these itis so you're then you know creating capacity your capacity building in terms of human capacity which i think is extremely important for all of us and i think that's a viable possible model okay and interesting I, thought mr chada you wanted to jump in there another point i'd like to bring in the biggest problem the msme has today is labor we talk about training them we don't have labor in the sector uh, you uh, you ask any manufacturer small scale manufacturer his so biggest it's not capital it's, it's not the uh, cost of doing business it's not technology it's labor it's labor he has his machine he can put up the latest equipment but he doesn't have people to run it and i suppose the reasons for that in recent years have been narega so Nare and the narega is the biggest problem narega and it half the engineers have gone to it and half the people are sitting in narega in fact we have taken up with the ministry to bring narega into industry why should you pay them money to sit and break stones in a village when you can bring them into the industry train them up the government pays the industry pays for it once we have trained the labor we will see to it that he will retain with us he's not going to run away i think the right to food is going to yeah. sorry this is not the point well uh, i think the the fundamental problem the way i look at it it is the industry should be able to attract talent if the industry is not able to attract talent at such a kind of minimum wages of narega what offers and all that the fundamental problem is we are not able to afford that because we are always stuck in a low value you add products so if you improve the entire mindset from the price competition to non price competition and move into the high end technology then and charge the price perhaps and because the the low cost production competitiveness of this country is something i mean that you can't really rely on that for long so we may need to really look at that you know can we really offer the market wages and why do you expect i mean why don't you expect the people to come from other industries if you offer the wages which they deserve I mean, if you are able, not able to offer the kind of wages because the cost of production is the only factor which are looking at as a competitive factor then i think there is a strategic problem the clock is ticking there's a time pressure which is why i'm going to ask each panelist to really reflect and i'm giving you the option you can either talk about achievable milestones for indian manufacturing particularly engineering exports over the next 5 years or you can talk about achievable targets take your pick but mr jayavant would you like to go first yeah i think um, um, achievable milestones you need to push that 15% share to 25% uh, growth kind of thing in five years i think so it's uh, if this opportunity of let's say china becoming to that extent less competitive in in a certain segment of its uh, exports today if that segment becomes available then there is a large opportunity available in that and it is going to be a progression so we cannot say today that look i will jump from a low cost base low cost low value manufacturing straight away to a high tech you know uh, uh, segment of goods so it will be a process but in the in the process of doing this or growing you will be in a position to take advantage of such opportunities i think i, I would so like to look at that is being built and Absolutely. you see that happening given china's relative weakening mr chadda i think uh, the biggest uh, thing that the engineering sector does require is the tough scheme it has been given to the textile sector it can be easily given to the engineering sector and if that is implemented it will really uh, have a big impact in the engineering exports and i would look at maybe 20% uh, increase year on year and we could probably hit 100 billion dollars uh, in the next 5 years percent increase year on year but there's a rider the tough scheme which is you know a technology upgradation fund put forward by the government is critical to this particular target uh, mr johan take your pick either milestones or targets what's achievable yeah i think uh, the way we look at it is how do i act as an infrastructure for giving my exporters my manufacturers 
an ability to hedge their risks in foreign currency. We do provide uh, forex trading on BSC now. Uh, interest rate, we do provide ability to uh, hedge interest rate now using interest rate futures. How do we get them funds? By way of IPOs or FPOs, that is follow on public offers. And if the way I look at it is, if the manufacturing sector wants to really go out and win the world, we are going to be there to fund you. I'm sure they're happy to hear that. <laughs> Mr. Nankapal. Uh, well, when you talk about both milestones and targets, I mean, in terms of targets, I think we should really move away from the incrementalism and then move into some game-changing thing. So I, I do not know why we should not look at doubling up the manufacturing sector's contribution to the Indian economy in the next five years. It may appear to be very, very uh, too over-ambitious, but then that is the kind of a number you should look at it, considering the potential what we have. But to reach that, I mean, while we, everybody talked about you know, opportunities uh, in which you know, it can support the, uh, the movement. Risk capital is the most important thing. While risk capital may or may not be able to, uh, uh, the markets may or may not be able to provide that, risk capital also doesn't come from the normal commercial banking industry. So like sometime back, there was a development banking kind of movement was there and you know, people supported the entrepreneurial spirit and then gave uh, you know, initial risk capital. So I think in this country currently, there is a dire need for enhancing the sources of you know, getting the risk capital, maybe through venture capital, private equity, angel investing, whatever you have it in, but just not only relying on the market sources through IPOs or what have you. Risk capital, greater availability of it away from the traditional sources is going to be critical to the future of manufacturing in India. Final word to you, Mr. Sampath. I think there are three things in my mind that we must do. One, GST, get it implemented as soon as the new government is in, build the political consensus to get that done. That's a governmental issue or a policy issue. The second issue pertains to ourselves. If you look at R&D spends in India, uh, and if you look at percentage of GDP, our R&D spend is 0.9%, so under 1% of GDP. Israel is at 4.2%. That's a tough comparison you're making. Okay, uh, you, look at, you, you look at even China. China is nearly at 1.5%, and China generally is, you know, is mass production. We are more precision, whether you look at engineering, etc. So we're supposed to have an edge there. Our engineers are supposed to be better. Our systems are supposed to be better. That's why you're getting precision manufacturing interested in India. But we're going to have to invest in that. And the third in my mind is IPR. Our patent filings are less than half a percent of annual patent filings in the world. And now I'll give you the China example. 5.4%. The U.S. has 22% of patent filings in the world. So why can't we, with all this capacity, intellectual capital that India is known for, our, our scientists our, and our engineering graduates from our IITs are going to Silicon Valley and then filing for those patents in the names of you know, corporations there. Why can't the same thing happen here? If you have it, you'll keep the IPR. Greater IPR always results in greater financial performance and most importantly, greater valuation, which is what all of us are looking for. Well, I think it's clear that for the manufacturing sector in general and for engineering in particular, the opportunity is visible, it's clear, and it's sizable. There are challenges, which I think the industry knows how to live with because it has lived with those challenges, whether it's on the ease of doing business or its infrastructure or its quality of power. But I think there is also a challenge thrown out that you've got to raise the, you know, the game raise the stakes, raise the quality, raise the productivity, look at it in a whole new way. On that note, gentlemen, thank you very much for your insights, for, your, for sharing your experiences, and for reflecting on where we could be five years down the road. I hope that the audience has taken away from it as much as I have. Glad to be here this evening. Thank you. Thank you.